The following program does not necessarily represent the views and opinions of Reality Radio 101, its advertisers and sponsors, or its listening audience. Listener discretion is advised. Good afternoon and welcome to the Bear Psychology Radio Show with psychologist, author, and speaker, Dr. Anna Baranowski, where mind, mood, and what matters to you are discussed. We're broadcasting live from Toronto, Ontario, Canada on Reality Radio 101. To get on board right now, send us an email. Our email address is in studio 101 at gmail.com and now right to your host of the bear psychology radio show dr anna baranowski hi everyone i'm so glad that we're here again today and i have a very interesting show and a lovely guest that we're going to spend an hour with today's show is on adult children of immature parents and we've got expert and author dr lindsay gibson who's a psychologist and she has written about adult children of emotionally immature parents. Now, I think it's such an important topic because what we're really trying to understand is how we're shaped into the adults that we become. And as a result, how does our life unfold? And, you know, this is something that we all have to undertake. You know, our lives are treasures and we have to figure out, you know, what have we encountered in our life? that has shaped us to become the people we are, and is it working for us? Now, Dr. Lindsay's book is fabulous because it really does a great job of explaining this idea of emotionally immature parents. And um, she expresses a lot of different uh, complexities that can arise when, you know, you grow up in a home and you either have to Uh, parent yourself or maybe you have to parent your parents because they're just not up to the job and when you go through something like that you may learn that you have to really suppress a lot of your needs your desires really yourself in order to kind of cope with what you're encountering in your day-to-day life and um dr gibson she she outlines four different types of parents emotional parents who are overwhelmed by anxiety and they rely on others to stabilize them, driven parents who cannot stop trying to perfect everything, they're controlling and interfering, passive parents who readily take a back seat to dominant mate, even when there's abuse and neglect in the home, they can't protect the children and rejecting parents who do not want to be bothered by their children. Um, And, you know, they're focused really on their own needs. So I want to welcome you, Dr. Lindsay Gibson, and thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, it's my great pleasure to be here. And I'm so excited about talking with your audience about these topics. It's it's just going to be great. <laughs> yeah, it is terrific. And I do want to rem- remind everybody because, um, you know, if you're listening today, we certainly love to receive your emails. Um, and that, you know, it's, it's actually part of what makes the conversation so great is hearing from the audience. And it's in studio 101 at gmail.com and if you send us an email while the show is live we'll be happy to um, read it and answer um, you know of course time permitting sometimes we get so many questions especially if we're talking about a very timely um, issue which this really is you know really really important to contemplate and understand how it might be um, impacting us or potentially 
Um, people we know, people we love may have experienced this kind of parenting and we're trying to just, you know, be understanding for them. So um, I would like to start by just asking you, how did you ever um, get started on this topic, uh, the adult children of immature parents? It really goes back to when I was working on my first degree, uh, which was a master's in clinical psychology. And the orientation of my program was very much toward child psychological development. Um, we learned a lot about psychological testing and evaluation. And uh, part of the emphasis uh, was very much on kind of zeroing in on what level of psychological functioning was this person operating at. And that was a very useful way to approach evaluations because when you can peg a person's emotional age or their psychological age, in quotes, um, you can tell a lot about that person's approach to life, right? Because we all know how four-year-olds approach life, how 10-year-olds approach life. So I received that early training and, and it really shaped from then on how I looked at psychology and how I approached psychotherapy and psychological testing. So <clears throat> what became fascinating to me was the idea that my clients, my psychotherapy clients could benefit from that knowledge as well, because when they would come in and talk to me about a loved one, or you know, it could be a boss, could be a friend, but someone who was showing signs of emotionally immature reactions and behaviors, it was enormously helpful to them for me to say something like, you know, that's how a four-year-old thinks. <laughs> or, um, you know, that, that really sounds more like a 15-year-old than a 40-year-old. Have you thought about that? Um, it became a way of them understanding this previously inexplicable behavior. Um, because, you know, when somebody walks around uh, and they're dressed up or they're in a suit and they use uh, an adult vocabulary and they hold a job, and our first thought is not that this person is emotionally immature. In fact, we assume that the person is normal, that they're like us, that they have adult competencies and, and abilities. And then we are shocked when we get in deeper with them, get closer to them in, in our relationships. We're shocked to, to find that they react in such self-centered or um, impulsive ways that are really more childlike. So it became a very helpful construct for my psychotherapy clients to look at the signs of emotional immaturity in these people that they were having trouble with. And I just wanna mention, Anna, that it was so interesting to me as a therapist that these people were coming in to see me to get a diagnosis so that insurance could pay for their treatment, um, to sign up for the treatment, to say, I have a mental health need and I need therapy. They were willing to do that, but the people that were driving them crazy, the ones that they were having trouble with, had no self-reflection. They were not interested in therapy. And so it was almost like the wrong people were sitting in my office. <laughs> the people who were much more psychologically healthy and mature were coming to get help in order to deal with the emotionally immature people who were really running wild out there. And so the whole thing became such a fascination for me about how to help people who were surprised and confused when they came up against emotionally immature behavior. So that's, wow. that's kind of how I got started in it. Wow, that's a great storyline. Um, you know, uh, because I have read the book, um, it, what you were just talking about references 
uh, something you refer to as internalized versus externalized um, people and how, you know, the internalized person is generally the one who is more sensitive and self-reflective, whereas the in externalized person basically looks at the rest of the world and, and, and um, you know, points to how their life is bad because of something out there. They're not doing any of that deep dive where, you know, it's like, yeah, you know, there's certain things that are going on. I need to come to terms with this, you know, very motivated to connect, wanting warmth and engagement. Whereas, you know, this, this internalizing and externalizing element can really be very confusing because I think the internalizing person is at great risk of always holding themselves responsible. Whereas the externalizing person is always at risk of really not growing up because they're always looking at the outside world for the reasons that they, you know, are frustrated or annoyed or angry or not kind of living in the way that they think they should be living or people responding to them in the way that they, they think they should respond. Um, tell us a little bit about this internalize and externalize um, and, and the kinds of examples you might have that go along with it. Sure. Yeah, it, it, it's a way that I came to understand the difference between people in terms of their approach to life. And one is more, uh, one promotes emotional maturity and complexity and grown upness. Um, and then the other promotes more childlike, impulsive, uh, often self-defeating, but not always, behavior. And why, you know, out of, say, three children in a family, two of them might be externalizers and one might be an internalizer. You know, I really don't know how that happens, but I do know that the people that I would call internalizers seem to be more sensitive and more perceptive. I mean, just neurologically, they, they just pick up on stuff. They notice things. They are emotionally sensitive. They pay attention to their feelings. <clears throat> they really can't not pay attention <laughs> to their feelings because they feel everything very strongly. Uh -huh. they, ask, they ask themselves questions about themselves. They wonder about things. They're reflective they're introspective so and would you say that the externalizer is more likely to grow up and develop into an emotionally immature parent um and the internalizer more likely to grow up into a um kind of a, a, a sensitive um connected parent that's my impression Yes, that's my impression. Because if you if you think about how they differ, the internalizer is willing to look at themselves, take responsibility, try to change, try to get help, try to make things better. But they they are able to observe themselves as an actor in their life. That's a fairly high order ability. It speaks to the complexity of a personality that has developed a full adult consciousness in which you think of your impact on other people, you have empathy for other people, and you can see how you might have contributed to your own problems, okay? That right, you but in, in your book, you, you make it clear that uh, internalizers, I mean, these are the dangers of being an internalizer. I don't want people in our, office, in our uh, audience to think, oh, yeah, I just want to be an internalizer because consider this, my dear listeners, um, internalizers are apologetic about needing help. That means that um, you, there's a certain kind of um, feeling of shame that goes along with saying, you know, hey, you know what, I... I, I'm not doing so well and I need something. And, you know, you, you had written in your book that a client might come to you and say, I'm sorry when they start crying in your office because they feel somehow that they need to be the good patient for you. Um, you also say that internalizers become invisible and easy to neglect because they just present as being more, 
um, composed together, organized in their manner of uh, dealing with the world around them. And so they become, you know, like the good coper, which is always, I think, a very dangerous position to be in. Um, and then it, this other thing about getting on with limited recognition. Um, and again, you know, you you go on in the book and you say one of your clients called it getting by on vapors and explained Social connection is like a trace mineral or vitamin. You don't need a lot, but you can get sick if you don't have any. Mm -hmm. um, and, th and then you go on to say one man was so accustomed to helping other people that he was stunned when his sister expressed her gratitude for everything he had done over the years. And being noticed was so unexpected for him that his sister's kindness nearly bowled him over. And, um, you know, I mean, these are, these are very significant things. I think this was a really, really important chapter. Um, and in one of the areas you went on and you wrote something, and this is a good example of the great job you've done of uh, these client vignettes where you tell these little super respectful and, you know, very, um, um, kind of wise uh, ways of describing the the struggles a client might have. This was Sandra's story, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Sandra was 11. She and her seven-year-old brother were sent to another state to stay with relatives for the summer. With apparently no concern, their mother put them on a bus for a 500-mile overnight journey in which they had to change buses in the middle of the night. Although Sandra felt lost, well, after all, she is only 11 years old, and afraid, she knew she had to protect her little brother, again, only seven years old. Situations that might make another child panic send internalizers into intensely focused state while they figure out how to take care of things. And as Sandra put it, my brother was really scared and cried a lot. I was stoic. I knew it was up to me to make the best of it that's so profound yes and and the internalizer as you as you've mentioned anna um it really feels like it all falls on them it comes down to them taking charge of the situation and making it come out right so there's a tremendous sense of responsibility that they have they feel like everything is up to them to take care of and to fix. And they expect themselves to find their own answers for everything. So, yeah, yeah so, so of course, um, they're drawn to psychotherapy uh, because the idea that you could sit down and talk with someone about how you're feeling or what's bothering you is something that is very... Um, very attractive to them. However, when you get them in therapy, they often revert to their old patterns, which is they begin to subtly, not intentionally, but just out of habit, hide how difficult and how extreme some of their, <clears throat> their feelings and their reactions are. Um, you know, old issues that have caused them a tremendous amount of pain. They, they begin to sort of soften that and hide that almost to protect the therapist. Um, and they tend to minimize and dismiss the intensity of their suffering. So one of the main goals in psychotherapy with uh, internalizing people is to begin to uh, help them to take their own experiences seriously and to begin to develop a warm empathy for their own history and their own experiences. That's a very important part of their therapy. Yeah, but it's not a it's not a one time explanation. I find that when I start to talk about those kinds of issues with clients, you know, maybe within the context of self compassion or any other language would do. Um, uh, uh, what I often hear is I have no idea how to be compassionate with myself. I have no idea how to be kind with myself. So always going back to this place of it's a not, it's not a one 
stop shop you go back you reassess it you figure it out you notice you're not doing it or you're moving a little closer to it and it's a kind of a you navigate to this um, rather than land on it and say oh I know how to do that now because you mentioned it for the first time right, right absolutely yeah. yeah yeah now I want to go actually closer to the end of your book where you have a section on assessing others emotional maturity because I think this is a real struggle when people have this kind of history of a of parents or a parent who was emotionally unavailable immature it's like it's a blind spot it's hard to really reflect on what are the qualities if you're going to have a different kind of relationship going forward with new people in your life what are you really looking for and you know in this little exercise on page 191 and by the way people are listening to this adult children of emotionally immature parents how to heal from distant self-reject uh, rejecting or self-involved parents by dr lindsay gibson and you can go to her website um which is drlindsaygibson.com forward slash books and you can find all of her books um, and I really like this one so here's the exercise assessing others emotional maturity um, and you have this great checklist so let's say you kind of you're starting to become friendly with somebody or you're, you're dating and you have this really interesting checklist um, starting with headers realistic and reliable and if you're re reflecting on someone, they work with reality rather than fighting it. They feel and think at the same time. Their consistency makes them reliable. They don't take everything personally. And then you go on to respectful and reciprocal. They respect your boundaries. They give back. They are flexible and compromise well. They're even tempered. They're willing to be influenced. They're truthful. They apologize and make amends. And they're responsive. Their empathy makes you feel safe. They make you feel seen and understood. They like to comfort and be comforted. They reflect on their actions and try to change. They can laugh and be playful. They're enjoyable to be around. Now, here's the question. With all of these wonderful qualities, if we have old scripts or beliefs or contracts with the world around us, like for example, um, you could treat me poorly and I will do anything if as long as you'll stay with me. How does a person then allow themselves to go and find these great people with these good qualities? Yeah, I that boy, that's the question, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's so um, really tragic that we tend to gravitate toward the relationship patterns that we're most familiar with. Um, John Bowlby, who was one of the, the uh, premier uh, people to write about bonding, about human bonding, said that bonding was dependent on proximity and familiarity. Now, it's interesting he didn't say emotional connection, uh, maternal sensitivity. <laughs> no, no. All you got to do is you got to be close to them and you have to see them a lot. And if you do that with a little child, they will bond with you. They will have that very intense feeling that they belong to you and you belong to them. That's bonding. So the bonding sense can be activated in adulthood when we meet up with people who show really emotionally immature characteristics that put us in a role where we are um, helping them to manage their self-esteem and also to help them keep their emotional stability. So if, if we are an internalizing kind of person, we will be, we will find it natural, like a homecoming to interact with other people who are a little insecure or seem to need us to build them up or uh, people who need us to help them get back in a good mood or kind of smooth their ruffled feathers <clears throat> or kind of take the edge off of a bad day for them. You end up functioning as a kind of an auxiliary 
part of their personality. And that is the thing that's missing in emotionally immature people is that ability to self-regulate their own self-esteem and their own emotional um, evenness or stability. So you might find yourself uh, curiously attracted and comfortable around kind of high maintenance people. However, over time, their externalizing qualities, their the way that, uh, by that I mean the way that their emotional immaturity shows up in their life, their tendency to project blame, to see everything as somebody else's fault, uh, to deal with um, frustrations by getting angry instead of solving the problem. These kinds of react, highly reactive, emotionally immature behaviors. Um, even if you really like the person to begin with, when you try to live with someone who is self-centered, uh, kind of thoughtless in that they don't question any of their own behavior, and they're always blaming someone else, that relationship is going to get really hard to maintain. That gets old fast, even if you were attracted to them at the beginning, even if you did want to take care of them at the beginning. It's such a dangerous pattern, Lindsay, because, you know, what you're really telling me is that people who grow up in homes with immature parents are at great risk as they age and mature at gravitating towards others who were just like their parents because it's familiar. Mm -hmm. And that's so dangerous. So when we come up with a list like this this one that was so interesting assessing others maturity if if the first you know line is oh well you know i'm kind of interested in that person and you know looking at a list like this we might recognize they really don't have this these qualities but they appeal to us on some level because of the familiarity yes and and the other thing too um is that it's very possible uh, for a person to learn uh, on the surface, a lot of these behaviors that you just read, Anna, um, for instance, you can learn to appear to be empathic. You can learn to appear to be, um, humorous or sensitive to other people. These are behaviors like any other behavior and someone who is smart, um, and, um, uh, you know, capable can adopt a lot of behaviors that on the surface look emotionally mature. However, this is, this is the important thing about dating someone for a long time. Over time, under stressful situations, when two people cannot both have what they want, where compromise is necessary, <clears throat> or there's some feeling of um, you know, conflict or somebody's not getting their needs met, that creates a stress that the emotionally immature person will react to, okay? And so you'll end up starting to see the uh, self-centered behavior or the lack of empathy or the refusal to look at their part in a problem or the complete disinterest in, in your boundaries or what you don't want to do. Um, the taking offense when you're different from them or you want something that's that's not the same as what they want. That stuff under stress will come out. <clears throat> and that's why you want to be in a relationship for quite a while, seeing that person in a, a lot of different situations before you can actually tell who is emotionally mature and who's emotionally immature. But more basically, you know, if, if, if someone was to ask me, well, I want to know right away, how do, how do I tell right away? I don't know, want to waste six months on a, uh, a dating relationship when I can find out right away, what do I look for? And I would say there are two things. One is empathy and one is boundaries. If they really get you, if they really understand what you feel and they offer that, you don't have to prompt them into it. You don't have to say, oh, I feel really bad today. And they say, oh, 
oh, tell me about it. How are you feeling? It's not like that. It's like you're communicating something is not right. And their empathy is able to imagine that there's something going on inside you and they approach you about it. Okay. It's that kind of sensitivity. Hmm. The other thing is that when you set a boundary, when you say, I don't want to do that, or I'm not interested in that, or, you know, I'm sorry, I can't do that this time. How do they receive it? Do they say, okay, uh, accepting that you're a separate person with your own desires, or do they try to talk you out of it or even shame you about it? Like, well, I don't understand. Why wouldn't you want to do this? Those two characteristics are the are the best um, little um, thumbnail descriptions of emotional immaturity that I think people can pick up on very early if they're looking for it. But again, like like we're saying, uh, lots of times the internalizing type of person is used to having their boundaries run over or not being paid attention to with empathy. So we have to work on accepting and cultivating our right to have people treat us with empathy and respect for our boundaries. That That is up to us. To- I love it. That That's so profound and so important. And it's such a, it's such a task of maturing that really takes, um, like it's a big leap in terms of personal growth. Um, you you start your book by talking a lot about emotional loneliness and this idea of not having enough emotional intimacy with people and that the loneliness of feeling unseen by others is often a very fundamental pain as, as bad as any physical injury um, and that it because it can feel so private, you know, you can carry this injury with inside of yourself. And really, because you you haven't necessarily shared it with people, it's hard for you to even kind of land on what you're hungry for or what you, why are you feeling so hungry, even? Um, especially if you've had parents who have punished you or become angry with you, if you show that you need some emotional warmth and connection. So can you talk a little bit more about this emotional loneliness and and how that might play out? Sure. Um, Emotional loneliness is a concept that I came to in the writing of this book uh, after I had written quite a bit about the emotionally immature person. And then I thought, wait a minute, Uh, for the reader, what is the effect of all this? In other words, how has this impacted their life? Because I figured that would be the starting point for the reader to feel empathy from me. And then it would be interesting to find out more about the emotional, emotionally immature person. But I thought, I want to engage with the reader and let them know I understand what they're going through. And then we'll talk about the why uh, related to their relationships with emotionally mature people. But I saw this so often in my psychotherapy clients that this sense of emotional loneliness was so profound for them within their families where they felt like they were sort of uh, the only person there, um, that they were on the outside, that they were struggling to get into the family, to be seen, to be heard, uh, to feel loved, to feel understood. And they kept feeling like they were missing this connection with their parent that is really the attachment connection where you feel like someone understands and knows what's going on inside you. You can look in their eyes and you feel like they know what you're going through. That is the most precious, validating, strengthening, 
feeling in the world. It makes you feel like you belong. It makes you have a sense that you know that you're not crazy, that this, that someone else understands all about this feeling that you're having. You feel included in the, you know, in the human race and the human family. Um, and it helps you to accept yourself. It helps you to learn about your own emotions. When and this is in, in sharp contrast to the, the truth of, you know, somebody might have a very large and active family network that gets together really often, but they are sitting on the outside in a way feeling like, well, I'm still alone. I'm surrounded by people, but I'm still alone here. I, I want to read a little bit about Sophie's story from your book because it's so startling. Um, you give a description. I'm going to read it. Um, you give a description about this woman who's having a relationship with this man, Jerry. And um, Sophie has been dating this guy for a while. You know, she wants to get married. She wants to have some security in her life. And, you know, one day Jerry suggests that they go to a restaurant that they've gone, that they went to on their first date and that there's something that he is going to ask her and um you know that's what sophie is thinking because it's like there's something about how he set up the the date so she is having a real sit on the edge of her seat experience where you know she she's so excited so the way the story goes and this is now reading from your book sure enough after dinner jerry pulled out a small jewelry box from his jacket pocket. As he pushed it across the linen tablecloth, Sophie could barely breathe. But when she opened the box, there was no ring, only a small square of paper with a question mark on it. She didn't understand. Jerry grinned at her. Now you can tell your friends. I finally popped the question. Um, are you proposing? She asked in confusion. No, it's a joke. Get it? Sophie was shocked, furious, and deeply hurt. When she called her mother and told her about the incident, her mother actually sided with Jerry, telling Sophie it was a funny joke, and she shouldn't be mad. I couldn't think of a single situation where this would be a good joke in a relationship. It's too deflating and demeaning. But as Sophie recognized later, her mother and Jerry had a lot in common in their insensitivity toward people's feelings. Every time Sophie tried to tell them how she felt, she ended up feeling invalidated. This is such a good um, example of, you know, how somebody who grows up in a certain home might gravitate toward a person who then shows very similar features. I'm going to start reading through some of our uh, listeners' emails to us because they're very interesting and they, they, they're they wonderful to uh, to read. So this is a good jumping off point. Um, this is from Tammy and she says, hello, Dr. Baranowski. I have to admit this topic seemed hilarious at first. Um, that's, you know, um, adult children of emotionally immature parents. Um, who would think? What a topic. First time ever hearing something like this. I love it. Thank you, Tammy, for writing in and giving us your thoughts. Um, and here, here's another one. Um, this is from Janice, who says, your guest's book should go out to all the adult kids in the world. <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> I love that. So there you go. Um, people are finding it riveting. Um, now, this one's really interesting. Erica says, in quotations, take that, you parents. What are your thoughts about that one, Lindsay? That she, that's all she wrote. She, that, she literally wrote, Erica wrote, in quotes, take that, you parents. <laughs> uh, well, that's great. Um I let me extrapolate um, just on what I think that might mean. Uh, it's I think it's such a relief to people to hear about this concept of emotional immaturity that your parent or someone who has has 
had that authoritarian power over you for so many years and has made you question yourself and feel guilty and feel bad about yourself and feel like you have to take care of other people at your own expense. You know, when they get an idea that takes that dynamic and says, wait a minute, that's not the healthy, normal way that parents raise their children. That's actually an outgrowth of the parents' emotional immaturity. It feels so validating that the person does have that reaction, like take that parents, <laughs> because it's like saying, hey, I was right all along. Uh -huh. Your behavior toward me was injurious. Your behavior was disrespectful. It affected my self-esteem. It affected my confidence. It filled me with self-doubt or it made me feel selfish when I was actually a loving person. So like, hey, read this. Um, it'll, it'll show you uh, what it is that you've been doing that has really made my life full of a lot of um, unhappiness and emotional loneliness. So take that. That's how I interpret it. That's um, beautiful. Yeah. I and I mean, I, I can see why you're going there, um, you know, because I, I think we we all have a sense of when we're hungry for something or when something has been missing. But when it's so embedded in our life, it takes a book like this or a, a, a certain kind of conversation in order for it to spark a, a certain kind of awareness for us that, you know, we we may have been really just not, it wasn't on our radar. We didn't put those pieces together. And then, you know, you come along and you start talking about this whole um, struggle with emotionally immature parents. And it's like, oh, just because their parents didn't mean they were mature. They, I've lived without emotional connection. I grew up without emotional connection. No wonder I feel this hunger, this like starvation. And I know you kind of wrote a bit in your book about kind of the, the genetic um, and the evolutionary need for connection in terms of our survival and our, our need to be close to people and how it's just normal. It's absolutely normal and healthy. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, that component of it, the importance of emotional intimacy and how it is really just, um, it's actually representative of you being healthy? Yes, ab absolutely. I'm so glad you brought that up because um, problems with emotional intimacy, fears of emotional intimacy, discomfort with emotional intimacy is something that is a hallmark characteristic of emotionally immature people. Um, and what I mean by emotional intimacy is pretty simple. It's when you can talk to another person and tell them what's really going on with you at the deepest level. You, in other words, you share your true feelings, it might be your fears, might be your, your sense of inadequacy about something, your worry about something, but you share something that's uniquely about you as an individual. And they receive it with interest and curiosity. Okay. And they can kind of hold it inside themselves. They, they might contemplate it with you. Uh, they might ask you questions. They might say something empathic or sympathetic with you. And you end up feeling closer to them because you feel known and seen. And they in return, not at that moment, but maybe a little later, or maybe in another, another situation, they also share with you what's really going on with them. Um, so you allow yourself to be known at this deeper, more vulnerable, emotional level. That's emotional intimacy. Mm -hmm. And wow. parents who are um, emotionally mature are sensitive and empathic to their children's moods and states and needs. It's not just they give the child a glass of milk when the child asks for it. It's when they guess or try to guess what that baby is needing or what that baby is feeling or what's 
the matter with that toddler? What's the real issue behind the tantrum? They try to understand them in this deep way. And that is a form of the same thing, of that emotional intimacy. Let me imagine what is going on with you in your subjective experience. And then let me respond to that, not just literally what you're saying, but let me imagine and resonate with what's going on inside you. And I often do um, work with couples or, you know, discuss issues around relationships with clients. And it's interesting how many times I've run across people who cannot tolerate the, what you just described, somebody sharing something with them that they're struggling with, holding some space for that, contemplating, leaving some room for that, the truth, the true depth of what is shared what this person wants them to know about them. No, they want to fix it and take it away. And it's like, we don't feel better that way. It's no. a, it's, 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 it's actually um, a way of making what is deepest in me superficial. Oh, that's such a good way. Of, that's such a good way of putting it. In fact, I had not thought of it in exactly those words, Anna, but yes, it does. When someone responds in a sort of a facile, superficial way to some deep issue that you're struggling with, it does make it more superficial and you feel less understood. So that's a really good point because that is what emotionally immature people are famous for doing is that they respond to something on the surface in a way to shut it down because they're so uncomfortable with it. Mm -hmm. They don't spend the time to hang out with you in this deeper place where actually, if you are accompanied in your painful feeling or uh, you know whatever uh, state you're in, if someone accompanies you in a painful state, you will, come out of it and grow from it that's how it works yeah there's this kind of place of grappling which i think is just a really beautiful and rich place to sit with and now i'm going to talk to the audience if you have friends in your life um, a spouse a child somebody who really wants to connect with you and they share something with you, look at it as just an opportunity to hold space and allow the person to grapple with this thing, because this is what we're all doing. All you have to do is reflect on your own life, moments of your own struggle, to know that you're grappling with things. We all do. This is, you know, this is a human element that we all sit with. We are grappling with the very complex demands of our life and nobody's showing up already perfect. Not one of us, nobody, not even myself or Dr. Lindsay. So just forget it. That just doesn't happen. So get over that part of imagining any kind of perfection we're all on our own path. And, you know, when we come to that place with a kind of accepting willingness to say, yeah, we're, we're all on a path, we're all figuring it out. It, it makes it just a little bit easier to show up with our imperfections. Well said, yes, that's, that's a beautiful instruction for any kind of relationship that's going to go beyond, you know, the, the strictly social. Yeah. I love. That. Yeah. I mean, it, it's the place where I see couples argue the most because, you know, one spouse wants to come up with a solution and fix the issue that the other spouse has, as opposed to just saying, wow, you're really struggling with that. Like I, I see how it's, you know, it's really painful for you, this place that you're at. And, you know, I, I, I'm here with you, you know, it, and that is just, it's a really sweet thing to share that. So I want to make sure we get back to a couple of the emails because they are, they continue to come in and I want to talk to our listeners. Um, this is from Sean who says, hello today, doctors. We really needed this topic to come out today. Hmm, that's very interesting. So very interesting. No one could reverse the roles of adult slash children relationships like this. It is always a kid's 
problem. Thanks for the insight. Any comments? Yeah, that's a very good point. It is always the kid's problem. Because when you grow up in a family household where the parents are emotionally immature, they are really in the position of authoritarian power. And what often happens is they have no interest in learning from their children. To them, that would be a completely ridiculous concept. Uh, They're there to impose their own certainty and their own beliefs and their preferred roles onto their children to control them, to tell them who they are, because that's the way emotionally immature people function. They want you to be a reflection of them. They want you to confirm who they are and augment who they think they are. (laughs) Okay. Mm -hmm. You manage my self-esteem for me. Uh, make sure that you take care of my feelings. That's what they put on the kids. So the kids are at a disadvantage in a family like that because they don't have the concepts to say, mom, that's a really emotionally immature way to be, or dad, um, you're not respecting my boundaries and that's immature. They don't have any way to, to counter that. Children take the blame on themselves. They internalize it, no matter whether they are strictly internalizers or externalizers. The child feels the sense of responsibility and blame, like there's something wrong with them or they're bad or they're selfish. And all that comes to roost in the child as a result of the emotional immaturity of the parent. And so the child often has to figure all this out later when they have an adult mind that can conceptually grapple with these concepts. But yeah, it's, um, it's very much on the child to figure this out. The parent is not going to have insight because with emotional immaturity, there is no self-reflection. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, one of the things about this conversation with emotionally immature parents is that often, you know, these are parents who have some of their own quite awful injuries that then resulted in this emotionally immature parenting. So, you know, if you have some feelings about whether you've been emotionally immature with your own children, because I've had lots of clients, you know, tell me about their worries about their own relationship with their children. And, you know, there are ways of really working with that content as well. And I want to really invite you that if you have these thoughts you know what you know what was missing in your parenting with your own children and are there ways in which you can grow or get become closer with your children or your children don't trust you don't want to talk to you don't want to share with you there may be some really good things that you can do to start to really do your own deep dive and understand where's the history of your own immaturity you know are you an internalizer like Um, Dr. Gibson is talking about because that's also very very important to contemplate and I want to just go back to uh, Dr. Lindsay Gibson's books because she's got quite a few and they're all available on Amazon but they also have you know uh, appear on her website at drlindsaygibson.com forward slash books but she's written a number of books the the one that we're talking about today which I'm particularly fond of adult children of emotionally immature parents and then she's written recovering from emotionally immature parents practical tools to establish boundaries and reclaim your emotional autonomy and then another book which is quite interesting who you were meant to be and this is really all about you finding your own inner wisdom and growing into yourself which is a you know kind of the next step and certainly would be a meaningful book for for anybody who's trying to really land fully with inside of themselves. So thank you for, um, you know, all of that hard work. And I want to um, go back to another uh, email. And this one is um, a little a little bit more in depth. So this one's from Lisa. And she says, Hi, Anna, I have a question for your guest. I've read most of the books, most of the books 
which was excellent. She's written your, she's read your book, Lindsay. Um, I believe I'm an internalizer and my family of origin are externalizers. Does this hunger for attachment, especially towards a mother figure, ever go away? I resonate hugely with so much of what you've spoken about, feeling crazy, feeling invisible, always feeling alone. And I've been working forever with an excellent therapist on this and more. I see everything you've said in the book, but I'm still so stuck in the middle of all the pain from the things they've said, the way they've treated me and still treat me. Also, I think the impact of this is still understated with grateful thanks. Oh, yeah. Um, well, my immediate response to that is, thank goodness that you still have that longing uh, for the connection, for the, the mothering relationship, because that is healthy. It's normal. You know, our emotions propel us toward interaction. When we have an emotion, you know, that emo that motion part of emotion means that we want to take that feeling and put it into motion and go towards something. Okay. Or maybe we want to run away from something, but we want to act on that feeling. And what that painful feeling of not being able to get a connection is doing is it's propelling us toward trying to work it out with the person that we can't get the connection with. I think that is a deep hardwired genetic thing in human beings that when we feel something is wrong in a relationship, when we feel like our connection is not, um, you know, the wires are, are not crossing like they should, we feel this deep, motivation to communicate, to be understood, maybe to apologize, maybe to get the other person to apologize to us. In other words, to make it right, to have an interaction that will bring us back into closeness. I think that is not only normal, I think it's ancient in the human being. And so you will probably always feel that preoccupation with, you know, trying to get the relationship to happen in a sense. But over time, as you understand their limitations and you understand how to get more of those needs met from people who can really give you what you need, you begin to kind of lay that to rest. The, the urge is still there. If they came to you and said, I want to talk about this. I'm so sorry, man. You would be there in a second, okay? Because that urge is not going to go away. But if they never come to you, if they're never receptive to working it out, you at some point will begin to find that somewhere else with other people. And it will begin to be something that you can lay aside because it's, it, it won't be relevant to you anymore. That hunger can now move towards a place where you're actually getting some of your needs met. So, you know, I think I think it is so um, tragic and lonely when we continue to try to get our needs met from people who consistently show us they they cannot and they will never nourish us in that way um so i guess and we're going to be finished shortly but i guess the final question that i have to ask is you know when you get to a place where you really see that the relationship with a parent let's say is is dangerous and harmful what are your suggestions to our listeners who may be struggling with how much closeness, whether they should put boundaries up or whether they could even safely be in relationship with, with a parent that has been um, emotionally immature. Yeah, that's one of the great benefits of psychotherapy, Anna, as I see it, is that a lot of times people don't know how the emotional immaturity or the disconnection with their parent, the emotional loneliness, they really don't know how that has affected them. They're not aware of it. But 
as you become more and more self-aware and self-connected, it be you begin to get back your ability to feel what it's like to be treated badly by that emotionally immature person. You regain the ability to take your feelings seriously, to not dismiss them or minimize them, to feel that your boundaries are uh, absolutely uh, your right, um, that you have the, the right to be able to say no or to say yes. <laughs> you are able to be a separate, unique person. And in psychotherapy, as you regain your sense of self and you kind of redevelop your self-concept through, <clears throat> through the relationship with the therapist, through your own self-analysis too, you begin to become the kind of person who can decide based on how hurtful it is or how manageable it is, you can decide whether or not you can continue in this relationship with them or on what terms, because you may need to find an optimal distance that you can have some kind of relationship without getting too hurt by them. Now, yeah. on that note, I want everybody to um, remember to take care of themselves, um, invest in their relationships with the people that matter, I want to thank you very much, Dr. Lindsay Gibson. I'm hoping that we can have you back on on another occasion and maybe review another one of your books because it's just been terrific having you on. And I want to wish everybody a gentle day. And thank you very, very much for joining us today. Talk to you again next month and be well. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to The Bear Psychology Radio Show with psychologist, author, and speaker, Dr. Anna Baranowski, right here on Reality Radio 101.